top of the hour and we've got a fair number of people who are joining us. So I will kick off in about one more minute just to let a few more people get in. Zoom doesn't, doesn't allow everyone to join at exactly the same time. So we have to leave a little bit of, little bit of room for that. Um, let me. All righty, so I think we'll get started. So welcome everyone. Good afternoon for those of you on the East Coast. Good morning for the West Coast and good evening for Europe. Um, I'm Lauren Kelly, for those of you who don't know me, CEO and founder of Opix Engine, a cloud-based benchmarking platform for software and SaaS companies. And once a month, we run these SaaS, uh, SaaS conversations uh, on operational topics that affect our sector. And I'm so excited about this topic we're covering today because there's been a lot of talk about it, but I've got two great practitioners in different ways um, joining us today. And um, we have a lot to cover. So with that, I'll get started on the housekeeping. Uh, we want this, as those of you who've been on our webinars before, we want this to be as interactive and as much of a discussion as possible. So please feel free to throw questions our way. We do have some time reserved at the end, but if we can, we'll take them during the, the conversation. So if there's something that you want further information on or, or to go into more deeply, uh, don't hesitate. And then we are happy to take questions afterwards and also everyone who's registered will get a copy of the, um, the webinar. So with that, um, Again, I'm really excited about this topic that so many people have been talking about in blogs and in uh, board meetings and a whole variety of places. And um, I think uh, it's an important topic, both from a strategic perspective and an operational perspective. We're gonna focus more on the strategy and sort of the pros and cons and trying to figure out if it's right for your organization. And we'll touch on some of the operational issues as well. And if we don't cover everything that we want to, we will consider doing a second, more operationally focused uh, webinar after this. So again, if folks are interested, we can do that. So with that, I am so pleased to introduce our, um, our speakers today. Um, Anitha, I think we first met when you were at Rapid7, which was, I think, when you first came to the Boston area from California, is that correct? That is right, eight years back, applied <laughs> on nine, I should say. <laughs> yeah, and you're, I think you were using the Opix Engine benchmarks then and then at your next company and now at Fireblocks, which is, um, I mean, I was just blown away to see last week that the, the Fed has put out for comment the possibility of the US dollar um, or the Fed considering a digital currency. I mean, you are right in the center of that you know, tell us a little bit about how you got there. Yeah, absolutely happy to. Um, hello, everyone. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me here. It's uh, fantastic to be part of this community. And uh, as you had mentioned, I've been associated with OPEX Engine in different ways and uh, have utilized your, your expertise uh, in, in different uh, settings for me. So yeah, I was with Rapid7 prior to that was in Bay Area, have been software sector for quite some time, dating myself now. And, and you're joined, so young. <laughs> <laughs> Eyes of the beholder. <laughs> so yeah, I joined Rapid7, a phenomenal uh, experience, was with them almost five years and it's a cybersecurity company and uh, was privileged to be part of the management team and uh, helping company take through different acquisitions, different strategic initiatives uh, at the same time going through the whole IPO journey. Um, been in tech for some time and uh, the cybersecurity was the core threat for me that took me towards Fireblocks. So Fireblocks is a digital assets infrastructure company and it's uh, pretty much plays in the financial institution arena. But with that said, being a and infrastructure in the crypto space is agnostic about industry. So now we are already diversified into different payment sectors as well. And uh, as you mentioned, yes, uh, uh, the Central Federal Reserve is, uh, is everybody is now considering it. It seems to be a new disruptive way from a traditional financial world. 
And so we're very fortunate yesterday, we announced our big Series E funding <laughs> round. And uh, again, it's, a, it's, it's phenomenal to be on the journey. So we're valued at 8 billion right now. And so the company is less than four years billion. old. Um, yeah, it's a disruptive, disruptive sector, right? And so, yeah, that, that's been the core. The, the fundamental thing is being in, it's, it's a cybersecurity. It is a security play. We have more than $2 trillion worth of value goes through our platform. So security is paramount. So that was a key element that uh, uh, helped me join the team there. And also, it's a, being on the financial side, uh, yes, definitely have eyes and ears on what's going on in that side of the world. And it is a it's huge amount of, I would say drinking from the fire hose. There's a there's a whole ecosystem is very young. The industry is very young, and so we are being a disruptor. We are leading in that space, and so there's tremendous amount of agility internally to be able to continue to you know shape this industry, the hub, the strategy of our customers, and so it's a constant uh, evolution internally for us on a day to day basis. That's amazing. That's fabulous, and. Um... Yeah, just thinking about the operational challenges that you've got in front of you, despite the, you know, forget about the fundraising and the strategy of all the other stuff. Um, that is so exciting. Well, thank you for taking the time today, flying in from New York. And tomorrow, we in the Boston area are expecting two feet of snow. So you fit us in there. So, and Chris, um, I think we first met when you you first joined Software Pricing Partners, and now um, you're running it. Um, it's amazing. <laughs> and you, you worked with so many companies and seen so many evolution variations of pricing strategies. I'm thrilled that you can share some of your experience. Well, thank you for having me. And it's a pleasure to be here. And, and Anita, I can only imagine on your pricing challenges. <laughs> <laughs> um, the journey has just begun, Chris. <laughs> yeah, I think so. So the, let's see, I, I, this would have been 2014, I think, when I was up in Boston and met you. So the former ownership threw a party and invited a whole bunch of people for me to meet. And I didn't meet any of them, but I spent the whole night talking shop with Lauren. <laughs> and I, I, I mean, I just always remembered that night. And I remember I also came home, Lauren, and told my wife, like, this, you know, this is amazing. I'm meeting like really cool people and, and they're experts in their field. And I'd only talked to one person that night, but uh, that was 2014. And right prior to that, I had exited my software company. I had hired software pricing partners and I was driving down to Charlotte for an interview to be the head of another software company. And I have no idea why I did this, but I just picked up the phone and placed a call. And there was a comment that was made that uh, they were looking uh, for a partner. And I just kind of said, without even thinking about it, you know, should we be having that conversation? And then who would have guessed that I had taken a severe right-hand turn, which I'm very thankful for, but a pretty big right-hand turn. Hopefully not on the highway. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Well, it felt like it at the time from a career perspective, but yeah. Uh, so it's uh, it's been uh, very fun, very rewarding. I get to meet people like Anitha all day long and then uh, uh, building the sort of revenue models and demystifying some of the gobbledygook talk that we all do in the software world from a pricing perspective is one of probably my most fun things to do. So I'm excited to tear into consumption pricing today. Excellent. Excellent. Well, first off, I guess um, when we had our prep call, um, you both made the point that we ought to define what is consumption-based pricing. So is it adding users? Is it, you know, Lots of people, it's just like in the early days of SaaS when nobody could really define SaaS and lots of companies said that they were SaaS and they weren't really quite SaaS. Um, I think, um, why don't we start off with Chris? Cause you have such an overview of so many different companies. What, how would you define it? Well, I, I would start by saying that there is some and we'll have to get into the weeds a little bit here, but there is some aspect of usage that is typically portrayed as a variable component inside of the pricing approach or pricing strategy. And the reason that that is popular, and it's been around since the 80s, is that if you use software, and you know, that's the purpose the product was built, then you're probably deriving some value in some way. And so if we were to tie an approach to our pricing that is a little bit more 
closely aligned to that usage, we're probably more closely aligned to value. And I think when we talked in the prep call, what makes consumption so hard is that it can be 100% com uh, consumption. You can have a variable component and have a fixed fee component. There's lots of different flavors of this. And in fact, it, act, it acts a lot like a gradient of choices that have to be carefully considered. It's not like check the box and we're consumption. There's a whole host of things that we'll talk through here in a moment that you really wanna think carefully about before you jump on in. And so correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'm hearing is kind of, it's not so much that it's variable, it's that the pricing is tied to the value that the user, the customer is getting from it. And that is kind of different from the way we traditionally price software. Is that, am I saying that correctly? I think so. So, so the, the, the thing that goes in the quantity field of your contract is the thing that we're, we're talking about here. And it's either gonna be a really big number, which is the hallmark of a consumption strategy, doesn't have to be by the way, or it can be a really small number in the case where I say, Anitha, it's a million dollars, it's a site license, go nuts. And you had asked the question, and that's totally disconnected from usage, right? It doesn't matter what you use, all you I, can don't, eat. I don't care. Yeah. yeah, all you can eat, that's right. And in fact, uh, the opposite of consumption is, is kind of that. I'm going to completely disconnect myself from all aspects of usage. And those are much easier to sell and really hard to make, uh, really hard to upgrade. <laughs> in fact, stories abound of the CRO that comes in and takes the enterprise contracts and takes them from two to three million doubles to four, five, and six million. And in fact, gets accolades and and probably very nice rewards for that but what actually happened was they got coupled up in all you can eat provisions so long after he or she leaves the enterprise comes back years later and wants to change those contracts because now the usage has spiked to be 10 times more and they can't and once you give a customer a provision like that you know i've seen some be willing to sue you before they let it go sure you know, it's just a wonderful provision and so you are tying it more to uh, value conceptually because of that usage component. And if you were to go back to your first question of like a per user model, you could, you might think that that's usage, but in fact, I charge you for a user and Etha gets a user license and now she can do whatever she wants within the terms of the contract for the module or the application that she bought. And that's actually kind of a form of all you can eat which is why it's not really super ideal for most companies. Well, so Anitha, you know, what's your perception of consumption-based pricing versus the other models you've seen? Completely agree with what Chris is saying. Um, I think just as a, just to add one more clarity for the audience here is consumption or a software license would, can still be considered variable, right? You can still, when you say based on users, your pricing is still variable, but there is a certain element that is fixed. A user is a user, but consumption, as Chris called out, it's tied to the product usage. And so it's a user and you have another variable which is tied to the transaction or the product usage. So that component of it, um, as Chris validly said, is one user can have you know, X number of APIs or Y number of usage. And so with the user, you're also getting the value tied to your customer adopting your product or your offering. And so uh, it is extremely important that uh, you think about it clearly of what choices you're making. It's very strategic to the business. Pricing is truly a strategic tool. Um, it can either give you a huge momentum or it can stagnate. Um, and as again, Chris mentioned, year one, you might be fine because, okay, you're a rock star, you moved into user base, but second year, what does it mean? Like you may stagnate. So it's important to think holistically from a long-term perspective, from a customer life cycle, how are you making these choices? Yeah, it's funny, as you were talking, I was, and, you know, just trying to conceptually differentiate, I was thinking, so... Salesforce.com, we can all relate to that because we, most of us have had some experience with their pricing and, and how that grows or shrinks with a company. So you increase, you know, per module, you increase per user, but you wouldn't consider it like if you had to pay 
Salesforce.com based on the value that you got out of Salesforce.com, whether you were actually using it properly or not. Um, they probably would operate differently and, and we would all be paying differently, right? Is that fit with what you're saying? That is fair. Um, also, it, it's only for, it, it fits certain type of um, customers, right? Certain type of business model. So with Salesforce, I mean, I can buy a license or take monday.com. You buy a license. It depends what you want to do with it. Very simple um, iterations of what the offering is, or you can get very fancy with it. But from the customer perspective, it doesn't uh, matter as much, right? However, it's not transaction basis. It's not the volume of transaction or as, as you said, um, per SIP, it's the usage. Think about the Verizon or, or AWS, right? It's truly usage-based in that case. So you, I can have one cell phone, but how much data I consume is where it can vary between different users. So um, that's kind of how I would relate to is like in a, licensing, right? I can buy a HubSpot license, Salesforce license. The user uh, has a power to do as much, but it's not directly tied to consumption there. It's not the power that you're using in terms of Salesforce's product offering of how it impacts them at the same time. Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. And I think you brought up the sort of cell phone comparison and, and there's a question here in chat do most companies that do consumption pricing also include a prepaid component? For example, you have a minimum commitment of 10K a month for X amount of usage. If you go over that usage, you pay more, which is kind of like the cell phone you know, example where you pay a minimum amount, but if you go over that, um, and there's different models where you charge a lot if you go over, so you encourage people to buy you know, higher level bands so that they get um, cheaper, per use, but then they're protected if they go over. Um, does that count? Uh, do you see most companies having some kind of minimum amounts that you charge on a monthly or quarterly or year basis? Um, I'll ask Chris first. Uh, this is gonna spider into your revenue recognition fund, Anita. <laughs> okay, so, so let's go back to the Salesforce example. Uh, so early on, they didn't have quite the broad array of um, modules. And so the salesperson was likely the one taking down the license. And that was a pretty strong link to value because as a business owner, you would say that salesperson can do a book of business around $2 million. And so to pay $2,500 for the license, you know, we're linked to revenue. We call those strong links to value easily. Uh, decisioned in the customer's mind of that, that's a no-brainer, right? Now, what would have potentially converted it into consumption is if Salesforce said, it's based on the, uh, for, uh, it's based on the number of uh, deals you close in a year, right? Or maybe they would argue, now this gets into how the organization wants to make their stake in the ground for their value. They might argue that uh, they should take a percent of the revenues. Right, because the deals that are flowing in, maybe for enterprise-like deals, are in the ten million range, rather than the small business mid-market deals that are smaller. And then, as you walk through that example, we just pushed a little bit more towards consumption percent of revenue is kind of like the ultimate, right? Everybody wants a percent of revenue these days, but if you can get it, I mean, it, it can be really great. But if you get closer to the consumption wire, you can get zapped. And so you could imagine that if Salesforce did that, I might say, you have no business taking a percent of revenue just because pricing projects are more expensive than a manufacturing CRM implementation. That has nothing to do with your value. That's my value, right? And so what we're talking about here are many things, but in particular, I just wanted to highlight that where you are on the gradient of consumption is a stake to the part of the value that you think is yours. And if you push too far into the customer's blend of value, so now you see your value plus their value, you can expect a lot of sales friction, right? And so back to the question then on a, on a component, if you had a platform, everybody likes to use the term platform, but a platform means that I have probably a marketplace, maybe a place where I can build out my own things, maybe multiple applications that enrich each other. One has to ask the question, if I have a consumption component, okay, I bought the platform, how much consumption is in the, the, the sort of minimum buy? And it's common to see a tranche of consumption in a platform. 
Otherwise, we oscillate over into maybe a very pure, uh, Anitha mentioned it earlier, I have a fixed fee, maybe user component, then I have a variable component. Well, maybe I just say, forget the user, it's just consumption, baby, all day long. Whatever you wanna take down, you pay me for. And, and those um, kinds of things take different tactics to round out you know, what's in that platform, what's in that tranche. And, and also what we're talking about here is that in order to understand this and to forecast it and to model it, which I know we'll get into, you really need to understand what kinds of usage your customers are showing. If you don't have yeah. that, then we're kind of stuck in PowerPoint and we might have a pretty big disconnect come rollout time. Well, so, but to this question of having some kind of minimum commitment or I know on our side with companies that we're working with that don't have any kind of minimum commitment and they have very variable ARR, um, once you have some history, it becomes easier to, you know, say, well, if you can justify calculating something as ARR, if it's regularly, you know, the comp your customers always, you know, do 20,000 worth or 100,000 worth, and then everything else is expansion or uh, overage. How, how do you do that, Anita? And how did you think about the considerations of establishing bands or if you do? Yeah, um, absolutely. I think one one thing I'll add as a bit of a context there is as we are looking or as we set our initial pricing, we had to look into what do our customers, how do they make money? How do they charge their, how, how does their business model work? And in turn, then also to see what are they used to, right? We don't want to create something very unique, very complicated, sophisticated pricing that they're not used to and they kind of get lost a little bit. And uh, it might actually discourage them from fully relying on adopting your your offering because they just don't know what the sticker shock eventually would be so to keep it very simple trying to make sure they're familiar with the model that they use for their other vendors at the same time that kind of also reflects how their business model is so you're able to say as start slow start small but as they make money as they grow we are able to grow with them right that was one key part the other part of it is also kind of balancing the risk right you don't want the customers to get shocking bills, right? The, the whole unpredictability of getting huge amount of overages, different periods. It does not work with their own finance organization. That's not how you want to create a bit of volatility. That creates a bit of a risk. It could be a churn risk or they may not be able to pay you. So balancing that volatility is, is one of the key things. The third part of it is your infrastructure, right? Like to be truly able to say, what am I going to be able to um, build a customer, keep it very simple. And at the same time, is your product infrastructure such that there's visibility, right? So it's a combination of those from an operational perspective. With that said, at Fireblocks, we've gone through um, a journey of pricing. In the very beginning, we had kind of a fixed price. It was all, all you can eat kind of fixed. Very soon, um, probably a year and a half back, we kind of pivoted more towards volume-based pricing. So we have a component, it's tier-based, right? It is fixed. It's a certain amount. There are five levels of pricing and it starts with the base, basic packet. There's pro enterprise. It, it, it goes into five tiers and it's a fixed amount they pay for a certain amount of transaction volume. There's a quarterly cap. So you can you can you pay a fixed amount, but you can use up to that volume. As soon as you exceed that volume, right, it's, it, it goes from, you know, 20 million to 35, 150, 750, a billion or a billion, like there's a tier and you're paying a month. When you, in, when you go, when your usage goes above it, you pay overage. The question for us is helping the customer upfront how to think about the volume potential because you don't want them to be on overage because overage is, is at premium, the charge at a premium. So we do not want to penalize the customer. So we work with them upfront to help them anticipate what the potential usage could be so they can lock in at a very efficient price upfront. However, once they do that, mid period in the contract, let's say business is doing phenomenally well, or they did not anticipate how the adoption could be. And they kind of rolled it out to more um, of their own customer base and they're exceeding the volume tier. 
Of course, there is overage, but what we do, we use that more as a lever to help them move up the tier. So it's not that we'll always go, we will build them, of course, but however, we will use that to upgrade their contract. So in some cases we say, you know, uh, we will walk away from not charging the overage. Instead, we move them into a committed ARR. So it's a better quality revenue. It's predictable. We are working with the customers and that helps them to see, okay, so quickly I was able to move up to the overage tier. How should I think about the future? So they, in fact, actually purchase much higher than they're over now because they know the trajectory and the path. And that is a win-win solution. With that said, we are now in uh, iteration three of pricing to your question of volume, right? Because it's, it's hard to know what exactly is the right volume. It's a part of learning. I mean, uh, cryptocurrency and digital economy has been around 10 years, but for the last three years is when it's completely taken off. It's a hockey yeah, stick. I can't, I can't believe you haven't. Trend totally forecast that and you know, <laughs> we do we are trying to do our own quantitative <laughs> research and data science and trying to do you know get ahead of market right uh, it's a million dollar question and we don't have the crystal ball yet right <laughs> so so it's that question of how should you think about it and so we kind of iterate you know based on knowing different type of customers so when we get some type of payment customers or retail customers or some type of hedge funds or prop traders we know how they went ahead and so we are able to use that knowledge to help the next set of customers to this is kind of how you can think about because it's not as mm. directly tied to your volume. I mean, your pricing, I should say, in terms of your Bitcoin price or Ethereum price or Solana prices, it's more the transaction volume. So there's a different type of correlation that you would, that goes with it. And we're able to do a lot of advisory and sit in the strategy meetings to help them think more broadly. And so we are evolving our pricing tiers from that perspective. And that's where, um, you know, we have a great question. What makes consumption-based revenue ARR and what would make it not ARR? And from our perspective, our guidance is usually it's ARR if it's, you know, for example, if you sell that band, if you sell that minimum um, uh, commitment, then that can be considered ARR because it's contracted. And if you don't have those kind of minimum bands, then you need to have really good documentation and history and you know, for the e-commerce firms that are have variable pricing and, and consumption-based pricing, um, it seems really difficult. But when you think about what you're dealing with in cryptocurrency, like who knows? <laughs> you know, in e-commerce, at least you can sort of forecast well. In Q4, it usually goes way up. And you know, there's some history there. But do you have any um, any better? comments about that in terms of how you more define what's ARR and what you have to consider just extra revenue that's not ARR. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think as far as it's contracted, it's an annual recurring revenue. So that is straightforward um, uh, observation there. However, we have different type of like staking and other things that we do. Um, as far as it's recurring and you're able to see some kind of a pattern, you're able to say, this is the amount that constantly is coming back. Though, uh, as we talk about uh, um, our cell phones, right? Every month, you know, this is amount that you're exceeding or you're, you're paying on a recurring basis. To the extent you can, uh, provide some sort of a evidence from a past historical perspective that helps you prove your churn is low. You can um, you can come around to say how that could be a certain element of recurring elements involved with that. Um, in our case, again, as I mentioned, it's more transaction volume. Uh, that is, though it's pegged to the price, the volume, even when the, you have the lowest price, the volume is very high. Um, you can see the uh, Bitcoin now is at 37,000, um, but your volume is still like, you know, 24 um, billion, right? So you, it, it's not, you do have some panic selling going on. And so the a volume is what is more for us um, a primary driver. So with that said, I would suggest that as far as we're able to lock into the contract, which is why partially we lock into the contracts, right? to give us that kind of a committed high quality of revenue. And so you will have a pool of customers who are utilizing up to 98%, 150%, some might be 10% because they're just onboarding. And so it kind of smoothens that out and which is why we are able to very confidently commit that that is ARR for us and that churn is extremely low. And so that portion is for sure kosher, right? And the other elements will have to go around in fact, truly defining why that part is uh, is recurring though it's not contracted, for example, staking that we do. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And so you mentioned retention as an aspect of defining whether it's um, ARR, consistency, 
and contract, right? Correct. Did I miss anything in there? And it's also the customer. We do a cohort. We are able to see consistently how the customers land exactly. in expense. So you're able to see that the the retention of that revenue stream upfront is is uh, very high, right? And so they are constantly growing the NDR in a dollar retention. Great. So can you so? And there's a question saying, is this just the same as sort of the cell phone pricing? Um, would you consider so just? Real quick answer for both of you, would you say cell phone pricing is consumption-based pricing? I would say yes, because it is tied to your usage. Again, as Chris yeah. mentioned, it's not 100%, it's not S or no. As soon as you have a variable component, it's considered consumption, right? If it's not, you're not, that part is clear. Chris, would you agree? Uh, so I, I don't know what all the detailed plans are, but there is a component at Verizon that does give you sort of unlimited local and whatever, but then you do scale by data. So I, I think that different plans have different components of fixed plus variable depending on, and so there's probably aspects of unlimited in some of those plans, but I don't, I don't know any other plan but Verizon because I can't get anything else where I live but Verizon. <laughs> That's true. I know the feeling. Um, so is there anything that you can say just super quick one or two things that you think are not consumption. We talked about user-based pricing. That's not consumption-based pricing, right? Can you think of any other models that are not consumption-based pricing? Yes, yeah, so the one that I was looking at before the webinar here, because we use Udemy for some AWS training. And in the AWS training, they have an individual plan of which you can buy basically on a course by course basis. I think that's technically pay per drink and whether you complete the course or not, you're buying the course. But then they have a business plan that gives you access to 6,500 plus courses, whatever the number is. I feel like I'm doing an ad for these companies. But anyway, as an example, uh, they yeah. kind of have a bit of an limited yet unlimited. And the reason I wanted to call it that is because Unli the antithesis of unlimited, which I fundamentally believe should never be in your pricing strategy anywhere, is just a, a large enough cap by which I feel like I can get everything I need and I don't feel like I'm paying more than what I need access to. And so Udemy, I think, has this pretty decent job of saying, you can get access to all these courses, take them as much as you want, and you pay me a flat fee for the year. And you say and that's in that not case, that's a form of unlimited because there is no component for any, I mean, you can always go get other products from their fleet, but they don't really, they're not gonna charge you for any of those usage-based kinds. Of, if you take one course or you took all 4,500, it's the same price. It's disconnected like from use. Yeah. Whether you use your Salesforce licenses properly or you don't. Yeah, um, and, and uh, the challenge that you have, if you were to look at, for example, uh, let's take like a network scanning software. Those aren't really ideal for subscription kind of, because you, if you have a wireless issue, it's the most valuable thing you'll ever have in your arsenal. But when's the last time you had a issue, right? So now there's like 11 months out of the year or maybe 23 months out of the last two years where you're like, I never used it. And so as well, soon as it's like, I'm not using it and paying, then we, then we have a problem. That's a perfect sort of setup for the next topic, which is really, how do you decide if consumption-based pricing is right for your company? And I think Anitha, you had, cause you guys have just gone through this in the past year, year and a half. Um, how, what were the things that you had to think about as a company to move from your previous pricing model? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And this is actually a very, very important question. Uh, it's uh, very strategic to the company. Uh, and as I mentioned, pricing is a very strategic tool and uh, it's important to align with the business model of your customer. We did realize that we were providing a platform. It's a technology enabler. And we were enabling our customers who were prime brokerage, hedge funds, prop trading companies, and you know all the crypto traders. So we were realizing that they're using the platform to do these transactions, which is how they in turn charge their customers. That's the business model. And so it made more sense for us to align 
with that. And so, which is why we were able to say, okay, transaction volume is how you're using the platform for, and that's what we are enabling you to expand your business or grow your business. And which is why we aligned our value creation, our pricing metric to that uh, denominator. And so I think that's important to know. Uh, we still, with some of our top customers, we try to spend some time uh, and try to work with them to understand like the nuances, like how do you do different offerings? Because in our different offerings, it's not fixed at one, right? In one case, which is our flagship product currently, it's based on transaction. In another one, it's called as AUC, asset under custody. So we need to understand in which cases, because I cannot use one for the other. I can do as a band-aid temporary, which we are in some cases, because we have still not evolved on a product side. And and uh, um, not able to do it extremely well. So it's a transitional step is to say, okay, we need to get into asset under custody or AUC or total locked value. For example, when we do DeFi, decentralized finance transactions for our customers, the transaction volume is very less. However, the, the value that's there is much larger. The customer makes money called rewards based on the value that's locked. They do not make money by transaction. So it goes asynchronous to the customer to say, why am I paying you by transaction? Um, and I, it seems like I'm paying you a lot higher than normally I would do because in trading, I do a lot more transaction. It makes sense to pay you on transaction. So it was important for us to say, okay, in DeFi where the, the, though the transaction can double, but you're not making money because of transaction, you're making money by amount that's locked. So we got to figure out internally, how do we know how much money is locked in using our product? Because that's also providing you with custody. It's providing the security for you to safely store your cryptocurrency there. And so in those situations, we had to say, for certain offerings, you have to use a different variable metric. Again, it's consumption-based, based on the value. They can pull out value in and out any time. So it's tied to that. Um, so I would say that understanding how your customer uses your product and how do they build value on top of it is how we were able to go back and synchronize it. Again, we are launching new products regularly. And so each time we're in the same process of going back to the customer, understanding what we are doing, and also trying to simplify, do we want to have different pricing model for if a customer purchases four different offerings? Is there a way for us to consolidate some elements of it so that you can simplify the decision for the customer? Is there a way for us to reduce the friction in terms of procurement for the customer? They sign a contract and every time either you go over or you buy a new offering, how complicated is it? They have to go back to the, you know, the budget, procurement, legal, the deal cycle can get elongated. So those were some of the criteria that we are looking into to simplifying even the purchasing process at the customer end. So you were looking at your own products and your own mission and aligning it with that, but then aligning it with how your customers get value from using your products and then also making aligning it with your ability to bring new products out and with managing the sales force. I mean, I think of not to beat the dead horse of the Verizon contracts, but you know, there was a time when when mobile companies had such complex pricing models that no, you know, you would go and you'd try and figure out, well, which one applies to me? And you'd get really frustrated. And over the past 20 years, they've made it super, super simple. It's just like, you know, cell phone, you get this, you get that. There's like five variations and, you know, you pick one and, and you're done with it. Um, and one of those is to manage your teenage child's, you know, usage. <laughs> So they've included all those complexities of your family requirements as well. Yeah, um, yeah. I would add one thing though, is to say this will be an iterative process, right? It's not like you pick one pricing and it is set in stone perfect. forever. It's an iterative process. It's also a process of having communication interaction with a customer. That's what we have. And of course, involving our sales team who have a lot of input on all of these deal negotiations with the customer. So you know where the pain points are, what would work, what would not work. So I would say it's it's iterative process, but you want to holistically do this so that you're at least putting a good enough pricing that you don't want to keep changing very constantly either, right? It has to sustain for at least certain shelf time before you go back and say, let me revisit it again. Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, going back to the Salesforce example, if Salesforce were to say, we want to take a percentage of your revenue because we are your CRM, um, you know, I don't think anyone on this webinar would think that that would fly because I would, you know, I would just say, well, I'm going to use something else. I don't need to use Salesforce. Um, or I'd say, 
there'd be a huge amount of friction because I'd say Salesforce isn't what's making my revenue. There's millions of other things that are making my revenue. Um, so Chris, you probably are the, the one who's trying to figure out how do you match up that, you know, the customer's business model and the value proposition with, you know, customer expectations. It could be that Salesforce is the whole reason that I make revenue, yeah. but I'm never going to agree to that, period. It's just not done. Whereas, I don't know, there's other products where it's just normal. You know, you pay on your credit every time we have a credit card facility at Opix Engine. So I don't even think about it. I negotiate the percentage I pay the credit card processing companies. But would I question that that's the way it's done, that they're going to charge me a fee plus I'm going to pay that transaction fee? So how do you determine whether that's right for your business? Well, I can give us an analogy that I, <clears throat> I've sculpted over the years. So if we imagine that the three of us, uh, sorry, the four of us, just joking, I'm including <laughs> Whitney. Anyway, so the four of us have a software company and let's just say for argument's sake, we provide inventory management. That's kind of what we do. And we're gonna imagine that what represents the value of our software company is like one of those Colorado mountains and in Colorado, I can say this because they have very complicated water rules and all the water that flows down the mountain, technically somebody owns, I, I think it's changing, but or may have already changed, but that's the way it used to be. So all that water that falls on that mountain is going to be our value and it's gonna coalesce into a raging river. And at the bottom of the mountain, it's gonna launch itself out into three customer fields. And in field number one, they grow tobacco. In field number two, let's say it's uh, paper cups, stuff that we just use for the, for the cheap wrappers. And maybe in field number three, they're growing the vaccine for the next variant. And then the question becomes like, who of those customers should pay more, right? Because they have radically different business the models. The same water, but three it's different It's the same water. And, and so... The, I won't bore us by asking the question and I'll just give you the punchline. And the punchline is they all should pay probably the same rate because it's really none of your business what's in the inventory bin because the customer is going to say, get out of my bin. And the point of that exercise is licensing this consumption strategy we're going to pick, what we're going to count on the quantity field, percent of revenue, number of deals, number of named users. That is an injection point of where we're going to count and we're going to lay our claim to say that's our value. So you can imagine that as like the end of the hose of where the water leaves the mountain. And if you inject your account like up the mountain, customers will love you because you're giving away value. Hey, all you can eat license is like halfway. That's at the top of the mountain, right? Named user, maybe that's down near the bottom, but that's not anywhere close to where it should be. But percent of revenue is probably like in the customer's field and you're like sitting in the field while they're trying to like pull the plants and you're like really getting in their way. And so if you push too far into the customer's field, what's happening is you're taking a blended value and customers wreck very poorly when they think that you're taking part of their value. And so the trick in that consumption strategy, which is a very thoughtful, carefully considered and as Anita knows, carefully modeled revenue outcome, is an answer that you're gonna feel comfortable with based on how you wanna sell, the objections that you're gonna get and where you wanna put that exit point of the hose to lay your claim to what you're gonna argue is your fair share. And that is an absolute, the most critical decision you'll make in gearing that product. That's a great picture. I mean- Isn't it? Don't you just wanna ski down that mountain? <laughs> <laughs> That's another, another issue. Um, because, you know, let's, let's apply this to e-commerce. If I'm an e if I have an e-commerce software that allows companies to access their customers, sell, you know, process, uh, orders from their customers and allows me to present, you know, through maybe different channels, just, you know, fabulous, uh, shopping cart or, or catalog capabilities then taking a percentage of that revenue might be okay because you know I can't really do my business without this online store that I've been given um, as compared to just 
leasing a shop and, and paying rent like I would with, you know, just a regular subscription, you know, flat software fee. Yeah. If we, if, um, oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry. No, I was go just going to say, if we take the example a little bit further, and now our inventory management software has a really cool roadmap and what's coming off the roadmap is an AI engine and we'll call it the customer finder. And you can run this and it'll go find you new customers. I might be able to now start looking inside the bin a little bit. I might want to just peek in. I may not have to like go sit in the bin, right? Like, so, so as the product evolves, that perspective will change. And I loved what you said, Anitha, which is pricing is iterative. You, you, everything in pricing is a hypothesis that needs to be validated. And you in fact have a product by which is delivering capabilities sometimes very quickly. It's not like you're gonna buy a car and get a software update and get a fifth wheel or a trailer. You know, you might get a little bit better of an electronic dashboard, but like in software, you might get the equivalent of something pretty radically amazing for your business. And so that warrants some form of a process by which if we're always increasing the value, you want to ask yourself the question, well, what, what goes into the maintenance stream that I've promised yesterday's customer that bought and what's net new value that I'm bringing to market that warrants me to be able to charge or license or package in a different basis. And it's in that uh, ability to be very precise and enumerate the capabilities that you offer and that value that gives you that answer. And it's amazing to me how many companies don't really have a documented library of their perspective on value. Here's all the things that we do. And, you know, we have libraries of estimates and agile and story points and things that we know that we can ship product on time and sort, but we don't really have what I would call this asset transfer value that says, here's the thing I'm creating. It's a lot like this other value. So that gives me a perspective of what I can command. And that's how I'm going to launch. And so therefore that's my hypothesis. And here's how I'm going to vet, monitor and validate. And once I do that, here's how I'm going to improve over time. Because frankly, nobody knows what they're willing to pay for intellectual property. That science has been out for decades. And you can go to any of the academic institutions. If I ask you, Lauren and Anitha, what would you pay for Software Pricing Partners AI engine? You know, it reminds me of my son's book, what's the value of an idea? You know, so, so you have to have some form of a process, some form of an internal discipline to zero in and tighten up that perspective of where you're going to inject that point in the mountain and what you're going to command in the marketplace. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to, in the interest of time, because we're getting closer. I mean, that was fabulous, Chris. And <laughs> It, you can come to my mountain anytime you want. We can ski and hang out. It's a lot of fun. Before I, we get into best practices, I want to, there's a number of sort of operational questions, including revenue recognition questions, because it's, you know, from the strategy to, you know, positioning to, okay, how do you execute? Um, Here's one question I'll just read out. For revenue recognition, when, when a customer crosses to a higher tier, possibly at a lower unit price, do you recognize it in that period and going forward or with a cumulative catch up? So it's, it's the question of, you know, in period when companies move from one tier to another and maybe they have, um, uh, you know, different unit prices, how do you recognize that overall for the year? That's an excellent question. Uh, and I would say that, uh, that, that there is a bit of a nuance there. It's actually tied to how you have set up your pricing tier. If you say that, hey, from zero to let's say 50, you get X price from 51 to 70, you get a different price, then it's a different amount how you're calculating what the with the uh, price there is in total. However, if you say, hey, you can come in, if you go up to 60, you jump these tiers, you get a different rate. So it there's a two, there's different ways you can, you can price it, right? In one of our previous iteration, we did that, okay, up to a certain stage, it's one price. After, if you go to the next, we'll give you a different price. Um, then it's a, it was a concept for us of uh, expansion. To get to the newer pricing, you had to come back and renegotiate and set up a new contract. And so we kind of looked at that a bit differently. 
right? So it was more considered as an expansion. The existing contract stays in, it's a 12 month ARR. However, when you came and expanded, you signed up for additional volume at a different negotiated price. And that had either three months, six months, 12 months, whatever the core term uh, uh, agreement was. So accordingly, we did, did that. So unless you don't have to make it cumulative, just like commission, when does somebody you know, move up to the next year? When do you consider the accelerated uh, rate, right? Because everything from the first uh, deal contributed towards your quota attainment. So it just varies on how you, um, how you, how you look at that. Hopefully, that makes sense. Yeah, no, it's and it, it is tricky. I was going to say it is sort of like trying to recognize expansion revenue, and and also, um, I think. Um, uh, so one, one nuance I'll, uh, in addition add to it, I just want to make sure that part of expansion was clear. When you have overage, however, we consider overage as in period revenue because you just um, you, you just crossed it over. It was that amount. Mm -hmm. We said, okay, that is in period revenue. It's a one-time revenue and we just took it at that period. However, the others, which was tied to contract, which tied to duration, we were able to take that rat value with the contract period. And I think what I was forgetting, what I wanted to make the point is that it really makes your contracts and the language in your contracts really important to think, you know, sort of forecast what the different possibilities might be and to make sure that that's covered in terms of how it relates to your rev revenue recognition. Yeah, the revenue, I would look at it as an output. The key thing that goes into this whole process, is how, what is your strategy? How did you set up pricing to begin with? You know, and yeah. that drives how you, your language around the contract should reflect that strategy. So the pricing is pretty key of how you're setting it up. That's what flows eventually into your revenue. If it's not cumulative, then it's much easier to do a clean cut. Thank you. No, that's really helpful. And your, your comment about sales brings up another question that we got from the audience um, about sales commissions for people selling you know, consumption-based price products. So how do companies handle sales commissions, i.e. with non-consumption, the salesperson sells to the cap of what the customer needs and gets comped on the whole thing with uh, consumption-based, do they only get paid on the base? And then, you know, how do you handle the overage or how do you handle um, that? Do you have thoughts about that? Sure. I mean, uh, we kept it simple, right? First time, first year, what we did, we, we kept it simple. We said the customer signed up for the maximum tier, right? In that in that pricing band. And so it doesn't matter. The customer used 90% of the band or 10% of the band. We didn't want to make it very complicated of figuring out and matching the cost. We, at the end of the day, the company got the revenue for that band. And so we just gave the credit to the customer for that, whatever their, their quota was booking or ARR fully to the extent of the band. The contract amount was uh, credited against their quota. So we kept it simple. In terms of overages, uh, we took two approaches. In the first year, we said, okay, overages, the salespeople would get commission. You will not retire your, your quota, but you will get commission up to your base rate. Okay. It's not eligible for acceleration. It's more customer doing more. However, we are evolved into a different strategy where we say overage is there. It's more as a as an indicator or as a lever for the customer to move up. And so we said, most of them, we may not end up collecting or paying. It's actually a time for us to have a discussion with the customers. We are also working with the product where even before you tip into the overage area, we are able to give visibility to the customers. There's a different parameter or um, the traffic light that goes on is like, hey, you're a green, you come up to a certain amount of usage, you're at 75th percentile or 80th, now it's a yellow, you're getting to 90th, it's a red. So there's enough heads up or warning that the customer is able to come back up. So we look at overages, not that we want to make money, it's more we are informing the customer ahead of time so that even if in any cases we end up in the overage situation, potentially we may not be able to collect very rarely. If that be the case, we will not include overage in our commission as, um, as an element that we will retire quota or pay on commission. Pay, pay so on you're, you're incenting the salespeople in the way that you need for your company, which is to work with a customer and to give them the, you know, work with the customer to try and get them into the right band as compared to being maybe sloppy and selling them a lower priced, you know, band, but then having a lot of overage, which can cause friction with the customer. 
Absolutely. I think two folds there. One is the customer journey is important. Customers are here for long term. It's not optimizing for the very first deal we make with a customer. It's not a good feeling. And so that's key part. The second part of it is like quality of revenue, right? We don't want too much of unpredictability, too much, you know, um, volatility and swings every month. And so we say, okay, let's just go with a more consistent uh, approach so that the quality of revenue is there. Over it just comes once a while. It has to be less than, you know, single digit of our booking. Numbers, so we mainly manage our overage uh, pretty small. So when we talk to our investors and others, it's like that is not something they need to be worried about. Just look into the committed ARR because we will always manage that to be very, very low. And so that's another part of it. I was going to um, jump in that what I love about that is that comp is often the balance between risk and control. And I think that in transitions like these, if you're going to maybe consider consumption, holy moly, do you need to be looking at that? And what I've noticed over the years is that sometimes I think the company doesn't do a good enough job of de-risking the salesperson's role in that transition. What I love about what Anitha said is we assume the max of the tier. You really need to think carefully about you know, their reality. They have mortgages and other things and they have certain risk posture. And so addressing those things and sort of addressing the risk is a lot of what we're talking about. And then sort of for the investor viewpoint, when again, we're talking about consumption, I do wanna highlight that much of what we talk about in pricing is risk, right? And so you could imagine being really super excited about the projections. And what if you invested in a dental software company or if you invested in a restaurant software company, that, uh, that wonderful consumption strategy just really was punishing the last two years. And so I just think that the, the risk and the double-edged sword of the nature of these strategies needs to really be carefully considered before, again, you just jump in from the uh, exciting blog article on consumption. Yeah. And uh, well, one other element I just remembered to highlight is like um, salespeople, you're driving certain kind of sales behaviors to optimize the company strategy. So um, more you complicate the commission plan, salespeople will try to optimize their take home, which is normal, which is totally expected, you know, and so you don't want them too much figuring out where they get, how they get paid. And you want a lot of backend infrastructure, which is not adding any value here. And so you're like, keep it simple so that they know what they're getting and uh, you know they will optimize to get the maximum because that's how they are compensated. So they will maximize with the customer. So you just want it all to be, to be aligned. I, I was gonna, yeah. I, I could give you a hug right now, but Anitha, the, the yeah. sales role, I feel like sometimes gets abused pretty heavily, but the, the, the issue that you just, uh, highlighted for salespeople is the idea of not just um, sort of de-risking uh, their personal comp, but when you put together the strategy of getting them excited to do the rollout and kind of wrapping in the overall strategy, we can probably talk for a whole another webinar about all the myriad of pieces, but keeping it simple for them is also crucially important because when you don't get the behavior that they want, I often hear the somewhat uh, not great remarks about the salespeople gaming the system. And I think the more that we view those as system design issues, yeah. human nature is a real thing, right? If that kind of stuff is happening, you know, you might be one of the folks that are inventing a new compensation strategy. And I think that may have already been done too many times before. And so keeping it simple, reduces these design issues. And so if there's symptoms that are poor that you don't like, before we sort of blame them on the salespeople, maybe the design of the system is off. It's management's job to figure out yeah. how to make it, you know, incent the salespeople for the things that you want. And I think Anitha is describing a terrific system, which has also allowed, you know, Fireblocks to be able to have consistent ARR in a, huge cowboy market, you know, that no one can predict, which also relates to why you've been able to raise so much investor funds, because it is true that investors don't like um, uncommitted revenue. You know, it's just a, a pipe dream. And, you know, maybe it's they can estimate the size of the market, but then it's just a bigger risk for them. And so if you can show that it's contracted, 
and that there's consistency to it and that you have a efficient, simple process for salespeople to sell it and for customers to consume it, then you reduce, you get the best of both worlds. You have, you know, consistency, you have low risk and you have, you know, consumption that is aligned with your customers. Um, which is I am mindful about. of time, but I want to add one more thing, because as you mentioned in the cowboy, cowboy market, the company is taking so much risks, right? And when we are introducing a lot of new like transition of pricing, salespeople are part of it. As far as you make them your partner, the culture you're creating, the transparency, the trust you're creating, they will optimize it with the customer. Otherwise, they are not sure. Will I get paid? Will I not? Who's going to screw me over? None of those, right? You're saying we're all in this together. We want to experiment these things with the customer. Let's try this. This is what we want to optimize on the pricing here. We are learning in this. And so don't worry about your comp. You're taking care. We'll keep it simple. I think that goes a long way. Then they are not spending their mind share of figuring out to, you know, best to game it, which is they're like, okay, we are trying this. We are not sure, right? You know, we don't know how this new set of use cases because we are to certain extent shaping certain elements of use cases with our customers. And so it is a trial and error. And in that case, if the customer, if our salespeople are our biggest fan and friends, they will try to do the best with the customer and the company. They know their comp will be taken care. I think that's important. Of course, you have to balance that it's not unlimited. You have to run an efficient company, but you eventually you can do so. There will be some mistakes when you're doing it, and it's okay. That's the cost we kind of pay when we are doing it. That if as far as we are clear about that, that is okay. We will not optimize even sales commission with the very first time. We will get that over a period of time. Your part of this journey with us. I think that's very important. We have made mistakes in my prior life as well. We have made mistakes, but the point is, you know, uh, when you when is the time to change and collectively you come together, the salespeople see it. Yes, makes sense. This is not the good quality. I've gone to sales kickoff saying, why overages will not pay or pay at lower rate because that's not high quality revenue. That's not how we are valued. When you educate them, they're like, oh, light bulb goes. Got it. All right. So you're like, okay, so now you understand there's nothing, there's no, no other intention here. I think that's important to make sure they come along with you. Absolutely. Well Absolutely. You are, you both have been terrific. This is, um, this has been a great webinar and, and there's been lots of questions. There's a wh whole bunch of topics we didn't even get into, you know, trying to match up the, marry the forecast to the, <laughs> the year. Um, final numbers and and um, all sorts of things in terms of uh, operational questions. So I want to thank both of our speakers, Anitha, you know, congrats on where you've gotten to and you know you're just at the very beginning of your journey. So you've got a um, as you said, a, a fire hose. <laughs> And Chris, um, I just love the work that you do with the companies that that we see and thank um, thank you for your insights. So, Thank you to everybody. And, um, you know, we're going to be sending this out, uh, the recording uh, as a follow up. And if we're, we have a pretty full slate of webinars in the next couple of months, but we, if folks think that this is worth having a, a deeper dive into some of the operational issues with variable pricing, and um, please let us know and send us your questions. And thank you, everybody. And all those in the Boston area, stay warm tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was, it was a pleasure. Chris, it's fantastic to be alongside with you and Lauren. Uh, I feel awesome the same way. Thank you very much. Always great. Nice Thanks, guys. Thanks, Take care. Guys.